In this video I'm going to attempt to calculate return and show the risk return relationship if you will. Uh, first I'd like to start with just uh, maybe the relationship, just kind of get a little bit of discussion on the relationship. Well the relationship is kind of interesting and generally the way we look at it in finance is that they're commensurate. One is commensurate with the other or for instance uh, as I add risk and each one of these will be another level of risk or some type of risk I have to have a possible higher return or in essence sometimes I like to say that risk is commensurate with return or increased risk must be offset by possible future returns increased returns So let's first come over here and look at risk, and, uh, or I'm sorry, returns. And let me start with a little history lesson, maybe it'll help. In uh, 1932, uh, a gentleman by the name of John Burr Williams uh, wrote a dissertation, I believe it was for Harvard. In his dissertation, he, he came up with a concept referred to as maybe the principle of asset valuation. And basically he stated that the value of any asset today is nothing more than its future benefits. And these future benefits must be returned, or I guess discounted, if you will, back at some uh, rate that's commensurate with their risk. So in this case, I'll put a 1 here, and, and it should look familiar uh, from a financial perspective as being how we calculate present values. Uh, we divide. Of course, we can multiply by the reciprocal, but make that a negative 1, negative 2. And if we add these things up or sum them, we get... NPV, and that's kind of what John Burr Williams came up with. Now, the reason I wrote this and mentioned this is because it uh, kind of fast forward to 1958, and a gentleman at the University of Toronto by the name of Myron Gordon came up with the Gordon model, and it's based on an asset. But before I kind of go into the Gordon model, I want to mention one way in which we calculate return. And really, calculating return is nothing more than uh, simply looking about uh, looking at how much money one has made from an investment divided by the amount of money that one has spent on that investment. So you can see that if you were to purchase an asset for, let's say, uh, let's make this a three. Let's say we purchased this. Uh, can't see it very well. Let's say we spent $30 on an asset that we end up selling for $3. We made $3. So you can see that the return of this asset would have been 10%. Now using that same analogy, this basic math analogy, let me apply it to a picture and then I'll tie it back to Gordon, uh, Myron Gordon and his Gordon model. Let's say we purchase an asset for P0 and let's say P1 is at a higher rate. We refer to that as a growth. So this, in essence, this asset has increased in cash or increased in value, if you will. And let's say as this thing did increase, that generated some type of cash flows. Now if we apply this model here, uh, I'm sorry, here to this right here, we can determine the return we would have made. Uh, return would be the cash flows, of course that's what we made right here, the cash flows right here, divided by what we spent. We spent this amount of money, whatever it is, and we made this much in growth so I have to add that to it and we made basically whatever I sold it for if I sold at this point minus whatever I paid for it and I'm going to divide that by what I paid for it because that's what I made and that's what I spent that's what I made that's what I spent now if I put those two together uh, of course that's going to be G you can see and uh, put those two together let's get another color to put this together you can see that I can apply this as a stock and say that the return of this stock is nothing more and the cash flow in this case we refer to as a dividend the dividends I've received during that period of time and I'm going to divide it by of course the dividends divided by what I paid for it and then I'm going to add this part right here we're just going to start calling this G so if you algebraically rearrange this model algebraically rearrange it and I'll put it in blue that we get the price of this stock would be the dividends divided by the RS minus G. So you can see by just looking at this model here and using this simple philosophy as what I made divided by what I spent 
what I'm going to divide by cement, I can come up with this relationship here, which algebraically rearranged to this, and that's called the Gordon model uh, to determine uh, what, if you have a stock that's paying dividends, what the value of the stock is today. You just have to come up with these two numbers here, which uh, in further videos, uh, future videos, we will. So let's come over here and uh, lastly, so we got a little bit about return. Let's come over here and let's look at uh, uh, risk, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to come right down here and I'm going to just kind of look at a simple balance sheet. I'm going to basically mention how we determine the return level here based upon its risk. This little picture here, risk and return relationship. And we mustn't forget that assets drive revenues. We subtract expenses and we get profits. And when these profits are made, we have two choices. We can either play, uh, retain them or pay them out. Just can't get this whole relationship. And this is the balance sheet. I just want to mention this relationship one more time. And everything on this side, I'm going to just draw an arrow here. This is called liability or debt. Uh, how we determine the return uh, level is based upon the risk here. So uh, the return level is based on risk so that we usually start with the first stair, if you will, here would be the risk-free rate. And generally that's some type of treasury security since the government has never defaulted. Uh, it's considered riskless because it's backed by the full faith of the United States government. We start with a risk-free rate and then we add various levels of risk and as we add those levels of risk you can see the return must also rise so some of these risks in this case are referred to and I'll put them right here below it uh, liquidity risk how hard it is to convert this bond to cash if you own it and you want to sell it on the secondary market if it's harder to sell then I have to add to this to entice an investor to loan me money uh, the second risk could be something like default uh, as this company uh, becomes more risky, I have to have a higher number here to entice an investor to loan me money. And then finally, another one is maturity. Of course, always there's a risk in time. We kind of know what's going to happen maybe tomorrow, but maybe not 30 years from now. So that's kind of how we determine the overall risk and return model for the bond. Now, the stock over is a little different, but again, it's no different in that we do start with the risk-free rate here. Uh, a little different now because uh, I have to entice the bondholder or somebody that would be a bondholder to jump in and become a stockholder or invest in a stock. And to do that, I have to add in some type of risk, and we call this the risk to the market. Uh, and of course, I mustn't forget once I do this, I have to go ahead and subtract out, and I'm running out of room here, the risk free rate. And I'm going to try to write a really small risk free rate here, which is that number. So we take the risk of the market minus risk-free rate, and we have to multiply it by some individual measurement of the risk level of this particular stock. And we refer to that as beta. Now, I would normally have put my beta here, but I'm kind of running out of room there, so beta. So whatever this number is, I'd multiply it by beta. Uh, so please excuse, I always tell people, we always start from the parentheses, so I'd do this, multiply by beta, and then add back my risk-free rate. And now I have the return, uh, risk return model here. And this is how we determine for the stockholders. Now, you can actually put all these together and find the overall risk and cost for this company. Uh, all we need to know is one other, really two bits of data. The one is the weight. For instance, maybe this is 50% and this is 50% and this is the full 100%. So if 50% of my capital structure is here and 50% is here, at that point we just multiply by the cost, whatever this number was, and whatever this number was, we just multiply it by the 50% here and we add them up. And I said there was two things. The other thing is the fact that uh, we mustn't forget that this is all tax deductible, so we always multiply that by one minus tax tax rate first. So we take the one minus tax rate, so we find the true cost here, then multiply it by 50%. True cost here, multiply by 50%, and add them up. And we refer to that sometimes as the weighted average cost of capital. So I hope this helps a little bit understanding some of the uh, ways in which we calculate return and some of the ways that we calculate risk. And it really comes right back to this relationship right here in the middle that that basically that risk is commensurate with return therefore as increased risk become apparent we must also be offset with possible higher returns.